Yeah, I just want to agree with Jim. Yesterday was a beautiful day, and I just want to thank those of you who had time to come out and those of you who prayed for us, because it was just lovely to see uh, Central Valley Church of Christ and Calvary Chapel people working together in harmony. It was just beautiful. Um, just saw Jesus working everywhere in people and in those, con those connections. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'll be trying to get all my pictures posted onto the Calvary Chapel Facebook page, so if you want to see those. I know we took gobs of pictures. I'll try to get that done today, okay? And then I want to direct your, your attention into the, to the bulletin for specific clean, ongoing cleaning needs. Um, there's a few put, uh, here, but there's one more I want to add. One is I need a person to clean every two weeks in the kitchen. Then I need a person, at least one or two people in the gym. Um, and they can, you can trade weeks so that you don't need to come every week. Um, also need somebody, if somebody likes to garden, we need somebody for the chapel garden on an ongoing basis. And then last one is I need somebody for the back of the sanctuary so that can be cleaned. Thank you. Good morning. I, I wasn't I wasn't here for the big uh, the big cleanup, but I, I can see it was really cleaned up. Jerry was telling me about what happened yesterday. I guess about 70 people showed up, and you know as Jerry was telling me about it, I, I thought, yeah, the place looks beautiful. All the poles are painted black again, and all these little details that you may not notice. Lots of little details got done, but uh, the, the the thing that struck me um, is that the beauty of a time like that isn't, isn't what happens with the building. Buildings are, are temporary. Buildings are just buildings. But there are those buildings made without human hands. And it's, it's, it's the body of Christ. And it's the people coming together and, and just loving one another. And that goes on forever. That's a beautiful, beautiful building. So what a, what a great thing took place yesterday. Great thing taking place right now. Open your Bibles. Let's jump right into the gospel according to John, and you know, again, when we do, you, you jump into John, you go, you go right into the deep end, because the first few verses are just overwhelmingly good. Um, sometimes overwhelming, just we don't distinguish overwhelmingly good, overwhelmingly bad. If, if, if you're someone like me, if I don't have a handle on it, if I can't touch bottom, if I can't see the sides, I, I feel like, uh oh, I'm, this is kind of scary. You know, if it's, if it's some place where I can't know what's down beneath, uh, you know, what, what's going to come up from down there that's going to that's gonna get me. And so I like to try and fathom. And, and, but this is, this is not a bottomless pit. It's bottomless love. And it's the picture of our God whose height, depth, length, breadth, his very nature is love. He is perfect love. Perfect love does cast out all fear. It's the subject not just of the Gospel of John, it's the subject of the entire Bible, and we so often seem to have missed it. God is love. Not just an attribute, not just a, a, a sidebar, but God is love. Bearing that in mind, it says here in chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with love, and the Logos was love. He was with God. He was God. He himself is love. He's the Logos. Jesus, we know him as Jesus. But Jesus is the uh, words that we have from this Logos, the logo, language, logic. Jesus is all of that. He's the expression of love. He's the expression of who God is. And of course, as you know, he's a person. And we talk about personal love and personal relationships with him. So different than religion and all the concern about power and pulling strings and, and getting what you want in Aladdin's name or God's name or Allah's name or Jesus' name. It's a whole different deal. It's a personal relationship with someone who in this case you trust. You come to have no fear whatsoever because he is perfect love. And as good as the Old Testament is, and as many times as we have gone through it here in, in this congregation, we were not reared and steeped in it as were the Jews to whom Jesus was born. He came to the Jews. Those were the ones that he brought the message to. And the letter to the Hebrews, the opening lines there, 
summarize all of the Old Testament. If we had never even read it, you, you wouldn't even need to because here's what the letter to the Hebrews, to the Jewish people says. It says, God, after he spoke long ago to our fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many different ways, in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. And then the letter goes on to say, that's it. God has given us his son. That's his language. That's how he speaks to us in this person. And I don't think, even though this may be a little bit of a repetition, I don't think that I can over underline. I don't think that I can too many times underline the importance of this opening line. This opening line that God gave us his son. Not just a sign, not a, a, a whole set of books or a, a a text or some other language, no other words, not, no other prophets, just he gave us his son. And if we don't understand that, if, if you stumble right at the start of something, if you fall right at the threshold, you miss the whole tour. You don't get to see the rest. And, and we're going to go through the whole Gospel of John. Don't worry. I'm, my plan, I, I'm, I'm looking so forward to every story. Mo many of you know the personal stories of his personal love throughout the, the Gospel of John. But just understand that when God wants to speak to us, he did so through a person. In this case, the perfect person. Because God is a person on the highest level, triune person. And in case you didn't notice, a person, like all of you, a person is a, is a package without a label and without a list of ingredients. And I don't think we like that, do we? We like to put labels on. Because now I figure I know which shelf to put you on. I know what place you fit in my life, or at least where you fit somewhere, because you're a person I can put a label on you. And I'd like to know what's going on inside you, because you might be a little scary to me, so I need a list of ingredients. And, but that's not what a person is. But that's our problem with people. It's our problem with ourselves. It's our problem with one another. It's our problem with, with God. And God sent us this perfect person that we can trust. We don't have to have a list of ingredients. He's nothing but good, but wow. As far as knowing him, any person. I, I've been married 41 years, I, and we dated like five years after that, and to know this one person who I love so very much, I don't think a lifetime's long enough to know that person. I'm still learning. We're still growing. That's just the way that it is. And when it comes to reading a book, you've know, you got to know how to read, and maybe you need to be smart to figure out what it says. But when it comes to, to personal relationships, if you want to get to know a person, it's not just a, a lifetime. It's, number one, love. You've you got to love before you listen. And then you might learn. And that's just the way it works. And I think as long as we spent in the, law, in the Gospel of Luke, those who went through it with me, you, you come away feeling like you got to know a person. It wasn't just a story. It's like, I kind of know that Jesus now. I feel like I know that person from going through the gospel, and it's going to be the same way here in John. I, I, I met a person, and again, that's, that's what growth means. People talk about, oh, church growth and individual Christian growth, and what do you mean? We grow in grace, and we grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. We don't get more and more saved. He, he is our Lord and Savior. We get to know him. We grow in grace. We grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And here's the funny thing. I, you know, I, I like to just look at him because he's wonderful, but sometimes I have to look in the mirror and I have to, to talk to my friends because we got, we got problems and issues. And once I see the light, once I see what's true, I often find that I can see what, what's wrong and why, you know, and why we have so many problems. See, because God gave us a logos. He gave us a logos, and we want to trade him in for a logo. A logo is something real simplistic, real small, just a symbol, just a sign, something that says it all. Uh, just a logo, just something. And there's professionals who are really good at coming up with a logo for your business, for your brand. We like logos, something small enough to fit on a bumper sticker, to put on the front of a hat, to, to set on our t-shirt, to say, that's who I am, that's where I identify, that's my logo, it says it all. And that's nonsense. You know, you know that can't happen. We just like to do that. And, and the crazy thing is, and this is nothing new, okay? This is nothing new. It's been going on since I'm of Apollos and I'm of 
Cephas and I'm of Paul. Paul talked about it way back in his letter to the Corinthians. But there's something about us. We like labels and we like logos. And man, do we make a mess. Even of this pure, simple gospel that was given to us. And so the, the encouragement is, no, God gave us the logos. He gave us this person. We, we, we like to have something that, that says it. Now I can identify, even in a smoke-filled battle, I know where my group is. And in a smoke-filled battle, it's important to have your, your standards and your banners and your, and you know, pick a flag, any flag you want. That's fine, flags are good. You know, my son Jonathan was here last week and he said, Pop, I don't think they get you. <laughs> you talk like a lawyer, you, 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 I don't think, you know, Oh, well, sorry, I'm trying. I'm not against certain things that you might think when I start to say it. Here's who I'm for, this person, this person, Jesus. I think flags are fine. I think they're very colorful. I think something like the Olympics at its best is a beautiful thing where you have all these colorful flags, and, and if it's friendly and, and fair competition, that's, that's all great. Pick, pick a flag. That's, that's great. But what we tend to do is you pick a flag and then you pick a fight. Because you're acting under a different banner. And I just want to remind you folks, this isn't a nationalist or anti-nationalist statement. I just want to remind you, you are the beloved's and he is yours. And his flag, his banner over us is love. You're, you're not going to overdo it. You're not going to... Well, you. <laughs> You won't go overboard on this. His banner is love. But you know, we just, we, we want to split up. We have this, some, it's something inside of us, it's deep. We want to do the reds and the blues and the whites and the greens and the pinks and the rainbows and the donkeys and the elephants and the symbols and the logos and all that's okay. I'm not saying any of that's bad any more than I say banners is bad. But, but just bear this in mind, as we're right here about the Logos, God gave the Logos, just bear this in mind, Jesus didn't give us a symbol. The only sign he gave us is the sign of an empty tomb. And that's a pretty hard picture to put on a flag or to wear on a necklace. It's, how do you do an empty tomb? It's just, he didn't give us one. But because we like them, the early church, you know, to try and tell people where we're meeting, they, they used the ichthus, they used the fish, and then they came to use the cross, and, and all that's okay. Again, I'm not saying any of this stuff is bad. Just understand what God gave us. And do understand this, that once a logo gets hijacked, it'll never mean the same thing again to the people who've been hurt by it. Once they've been harmed by that logo, they're never going to see it the same. You know, I know folks that grew up in the South, and, and for them, the Confederate flag is, a, is something about... Pride in a good sense, you know, pride not to oppress anyone, just we're from the South. It's Dixie. It's our flag. But, you know, we've seen in, in recent times how, you know, people who've been hurt by that, they don't see what you see. They just see that flag and they see something else because it, it, you know, maybe it got hijacked. I don't know, but that's what it came. Here I go again. But, but take the swastika for a second. You know what that one looks like? The, the that's been around a long time. It's a geometrical form, like a circle or a square or a triangle. And you'll find it on buildings and you'll find it in places. In fact, when we were over in Israel back in 99, it was on a, a, an ancient synagogue and, and someone said, why is that swastika there? Ooh, and then suddenly, you know, conspiracy theories and time travelers and all these weird things. But the fact is, is even the word swastika comes from the, the Vedic, it comes from India. It's just a symbol and typically it was a symbol that meant good luck and you know, good fortune and all that kind of stuff. It was just a symbol of something. And to them, who knows, it might have meant good things, might have meant bad. But once the Nazis got a hold of it, that logo will never mean the same thing again, anywhere, ever, unless you go to another planet. That's just the way logos work. That's just the way our, our psyche works. And God so loved the world that he didn't give us a logo, he gave us the logos. He didn't give us a sign. You know, even something, I'll go one more little step, even something as silly as a Maranatha dove that was once drawn on a, drawn on a napkin 
when some music players were talking about what to do with their music and somebody drew this little goofy looking dove and later that got copyrighted and after Pastor Chuck Smith died and Calvary did its different splits like things do then the battle was over who has the copyright who has the trademark for the for the dove and what have you been doing with your dove lately do you deserve your dove uh, you know all this it's just God so loved the world he gave us something that's not so easy to label not so easy to, to, to see what it's all about. He gave us a person, and this book will, will tell us who this person is, but he didn't give us a sign, he gave us his son. He gave us a person. And that person, Jesus, never wrote a book. He never wrote a letter that we know of. The only words that he wrote down that we know of were in the dirt. And we don't even know what he wrote there in the dirt. And certainly no one preserved it because you know what? That's not the way he approaches things. He never left us a sacred symbol. He didn't leave us the, the sign of the cross. He died on the cross. I understand people picked it up and people wear it and then some people turn it into an iron cross and some people turn it into a crusading cross. And there's a lot of folks, Muslim and Jew perhaps, that they'll see the cross and since it got hijacked by people who went to war with it, they'll never see that symbol as anything but a symbol of, of cruelty. So what you gotta do is don't like fight for the symbol, find another way around because God gave us his son. He gave us ways in which we can contact one another skin to skin, hug to hug, kind word to kind word. He gave us a person who loves us didn't give us a sacred symbol. There's no Christian symbol that we have to fight for. He didn't give us a colored banner that we have to, that's the banner. He gave us himself. And he says, as I have loved you, love one another. And that may frustrate you if you want to fast track separation and fast track the appearance of knowledge. I know because I've got it labeled. But one more point on this point. You can't fast-track knowledge or wisdom. Love is patient. You can't fast-track patience. Love is kind. And so, with those basic truths, love came in human flesh. That's what we're reading here. Love came in human flesh. And it says, verse 2, that he was in the beginning, like we saw last week. He was in Genesis with God. And all things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being and in him was life and that's what we focused on especially last week in him that is in love was and, and in love still is life and again when we talk about life we're not talking about mere biological life it's just like survive survive if you survive you're alive yes that's biological life but that's not the life talked about here right now as many of you know I'm dealing with cancer cancer is a very great survivor such a great survivor that it'll kill everything else because it wants to survive. And it lives! But that's not the kind of life that we're talking about. In him, in love, there's a different, a much higher kind of life. I talked about the, the little microbes that Israel accidentally crash-landed on the moon. Those little things that may still be alive because they can survive boiling in water and all these crazy things. And oh, there's life on the moon. But you know what? There are things like anger, and bitterness and hatred that'll survive almost anything. You can boil them, you can crush them, you can do almost anything with them, and unless you want to be rid of them, that kind of stuff, like cancer itself, it'll, it'll continue to live. But that's not the life. When it says in love is life, we're not talking about that kind of life. And let me just, one more time, we sang the song, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who doesn't love doesn't know God, because God is love. Just wanted to tell you that one more time, because you might think that I'm going overboard with this. I just want you to know John's overboard too. The Bible's overboard. If, if you think that you've got to rein that in a little bit. In him, in love, in this personal love is life, and then it says, the life was the light of men. The light of men. You want to talk about enlightenment? You want to talk about wisdom? You want to talk about really knowing 
important things. What does it mean to be enlightened? Now, there's, a, there's a group of, of modern atheists, I think Richard Dawkins is probably the most vocal of them. They call themselves the brights. We're the brights, and they, they think that most of you are pretty dim by comparison. They think that others that don't see things in a materialistic way only. And they're experts, they're far smarter than me when it comes to physics or math or whatever their area of expertise is, but, but they claim this, this brightness based upon their intellect and their knowledge, and, and at least in terms of what I've seen of someone like Richard Dawkins, I don't see a real happy person. I don't see a person with hope and life and joy, and, and I don't know, I hope, I, I hope you can find those things, but you don't find it through studying, whatever truth you can find through science. Here it says, in love, is enlightenment. In him is the light of men. And when we talk about the light of men, we're not talking about the mere light of the stars. That's like energy. It's just physical light. We're talking about moral light. We're talking about the light of men. And the light of men, enlightenment, really being bright, really, really getting it, really smarting, white, wisening up in life. You, you measure wisdom in the same terms that you measure life, love. You measure it in love, not in pounds or inches or scholarships or, or credentials or what, wisdom is measured in love. If you're, if you're one, one of the brightest lights, one of the wisest persons you might see at any given moment, might just be that mother sitting up at night with her sick child. And she's enlightened and she's wise. And there the, the, the light dwells, and, and that's what Jesus came to, to show us, real enlightenment. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, the Corinthians had a real problem with this being wise guys and smart and knowledge, and they lived in Corinth. They, they were big into the, all of the, the thinking of, of Athens and the Greeks and all of that. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul said, knowledge is good, but knowledge just puffs you up. Love actually builds you up. And if anyone thinks that he knows something, he doesn't yet know what he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, which by the way is love your neighbor as yourself, you can't separate it out. If you love God, if you love your neighbor, if you love, then you're known by God. You know, then you're really on the, on the top tier of enlightenment. Because love is the way that it is. And so here it says that in love, in Jesus, in this person who is love, in him is life, and that life is the enlightenment of men. And then it says, verse 5, and that light shines in the darkness. Don't forget that. You've seen it, you know it, but that light of love shines in the darkness. It doesn't say that it, that it survives the darkness, that it somehow gets through the darkness, that it sputters in the darkness, gets all kind of stained and crumpled, but barely makes it through somehow. It's going to somehow barely get by in the darkness. Now, it says it shines in the darkness, which when you look at it that way, darkness is no big deal. Darkness is just the stuff that's not getting it yet. But the light actually shines in the darkness. You know, if you light a match or light a little candle and you do that right, fullness of the day out right in the sunlight, it's no big deal. Probably no one will even notice. You can probably even see how, how light that is because it's just a little light in a bright day. But man, you go into the darkness. You go into a dark place and you, you know, if, in fact, if you've been in just total darkness for a while and you strike that match, it's almost like too much. It's dazzling. It's scary. It's just light in the darkness. It's, it's incredible. And so focusing on darkness and how dark darkness is and all of that is really just going into the darkness, and that's a bad mistake. I, I do too much of that. I, I, I try to tell you folks all the dumb things I do so that maybe I can help you just do better. And really, quite frankly, I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to live out this life and enjoy it to the, to the fullness. And as such, it's just important. It's a lot of darkness. It might be darkness in your neighborhood, in your family, in your marriage, in your job, places where you wish there was more light, more wisdom, more, more love, but don't focus on the darkness and don't ever give it more credit than it deserves. 
And, and when it comes for answers, when it comes to, to thinking, because you don't know, you don't have enough light yet. I don't have enough light. I don't see. I want to see more. And then you start looking out. I start looking out into the darkness. I start, and, and there's this thing, the Spirit of God, I believe, that's been talking to me lately, saying, Bruce, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. But, 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 but. Don't go there. Don't go to the darkness. Don't look out in, in what you can't know. To, to try to find out what you need to know. Don't go to the darkness. We go through the darkness. But don't go to the darkness. It doesn't know. It can't tell you. It's in the dark. <laughs> just, just go to the light. Go to the light. And, and I find in the dark hours that I've gone through these last, not just few weeks, really a few months, several months, been some kind of difficult times in my life, you know, Probably nothing compared to what a lot of you folks have faced, but I'm a wimp, I know that. It never helps, I always whip myself. You wimp, no, that doesn't help either. <laughs> but I have found in the dark hours of my life just a little bit of love. Finding that love, living that love, showing that love, oh man. That little bit of light, I've, I've come to find in the dark hours, like I think all of us have discovered in, in wintertime, that those little lights, a match, a candle, something you wouldn't even notice maybe at the beach in summer, those little lights, aren't those candles, Christmas candles, aren't those little lights, isn't it cozy? Everything's cold and dark and you got this little candle, you got this little light. And I've been finding, it's beautiful. I've been celebrating Christmas right in the middle of August. Just saying, hey, this is cozy, this is cool, this is warm. Even a little love, I don't have much love. Well. You've been given much love. And if you'll even share just a little love, even a little love is a little light. And a little light is no small thing, especially not for those in darkness. And the light shines in the darkness. But understand this, the darkness did not comprehend it. And that's a, you know, if, if you really want to get the exact interpretation, what did John mean? And you want to spend 30 years studying Greek, good luck. Because even when you're an expert, a true expert on this, you find there's an ambiguity. It can equally mean one of two things. The darkness didn't understand or comprehend it, or the darkness didn't overwhelm or defeat it. And I think both are true. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness doesn't understand, because it's dark. The darkness doesn't appreciate it. You know, if, if you're walking in love, if you're doing the right thing, if you're holding on to that light, and then you're waiting for those in the dark to say, good job, wow, I really admire you. Send you a card. Yeah, you, you don't get cards out of the darkness because they don't get it. They don't understand it. When I say they, people in the darkness are people just like us. God help them. It's a lousy place to be in the darkness. If you're walking in light, just thank God for that and pray for the people who haven't got it yet. Their, their, their inability to appreciate what you're receiving doesn't take anything from you, doesn't make it a little like, oh, until they're all convinced, until they all see what I see, I can't be happy. Huh. Be happy. You see it. You know it. You're, you're showing it. You're, you're, you're in that place and, and just understand that darkness or anyone who's in the dark just can't appreciate it. They can't benefit from it. If they did benefit, then they would lighten up. And the hope is that maybe they will lighten up later. But when we see this story of Jesus, we'll find how often he's not going around being frustrated. He gets frustrated, certainly, with his disciples once in a while. He spends so much time, and they don't seem to get it. Certainly, how can these people, these religious leaders who've memorized the Old Testament not get it? You see some of that human passion coming forth from him, but throughout all the stories, he's patient and he's kind. He's saying, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. And if someone doesn't get it, it's not the end. It's sad to, to, to be stuck in the darkness, but here's the good news. No one has to be overwhelmed by the darkness. No one needs to feel like they need to stay stuck. You can turn to the light. God so loved the world, he gave us his son. He's with us still. But the darkness doesn't appreciate it. The darkness doesn't understand it. Whenever it does, it'll lighten up. It'll be, it'll be light. But it doesn't benefit. That's one half of it. The darkness doesn't understand it. The other half is the darkness can't overwhelm it. 
The darkness can't uh, make the light a little less light. It can't stain the light. It can't affect the light. Keep that in mind. Keep it in heart. I think it'll help you a lot. It helps me a lot. This, the story we read, you already know the story. But man, the more you look at it, the more you look at the light, and the more you look at your life and the world around us in the, in the light of this light, in the light of this story, you grow in grace. You grow in the knowledge of Him. And Jesus, God, love, came in human flesh. And the great lights of His time didn't get it. Not the religious lights of Jerusalem or the intellectual lights of Greece or the political lights of Rome. None of them got it. None of them got it. And the reason why they didn't get it then It'll, we'll get there later on in the chapter. Because they loved darkness. That's what we tend to do. Especially when we think that darkness helps us in some way. I, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of, of something coming out. I'm afraid of something being seen. I'm afraid of being who I really am. That's why perfect love casts out all fear. And it, perfect light casts out all darkness. Because you realize that, you know what? Whatever he finds, he can fix. And, and there's nothing I really want in the darkness. Maybe the darkness keeps me in power. Maybe the darkness keeps me with my whatever I want to protect. But man, it, how good it is to just come to the light. But the great lights of, of his time didn't get it. You don't see Jesus sad. You don't see Jesus going to uh, someone else who's a, a better marketing expert or a political person who can get the message out. He says, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Didn't seem like very many got it, but you know what? Jesus didn't lose. The light shone in the darkness, and it, and it shines still today. And he's winning because he won, and he will win. And those who benefit from that light are those who believe. Not because that's the rule. It says right here, if you don't believe, you can't. It's just the way that it is. If you, if you don't believe that that's light, if you don't receive any hope from that, then, but still, the light's there. The hope's there. So if you'll believe this, if you'll believe that God loves you in this way, if you believe that this is the very nature of God, it'll benefit you immensely. The light shines in the darkness. Doesn't matter how many people don't get it. That doesn't say anything. We don't pick up an opinion poll to find out if it's working. If you believe it, you'll find he works. He works within, he changes your life, even if it stays dark all around you. Those who benefit from this, it's not the ones who tag the tree, who say, Mother, may I, who pull out the card and sign it. Those who benefit are those who believe, and those who believe are those who do it. If you don't do it, if you don't live it, you don't really believe it. And so much of the Bible says that. And it comes back to that simplicity of you've been loved, just love. Live the love, show the love, find the love, know that you're loved. But that's the proof. You don't need a label. You don't have to worry if someone mislabels you. You don't have to sit and wonder what kind of ingredients. What's, oh, maybe there's worse things inside of me than I thought. Maybe. But once the light comes inside of you, once God's love comes inside of you, he will win. And he'll help you. He'll change you. Love is patient and kind. You want to be a real Christian? Be patient. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with your neighbor. Be patient with other folks that maybe they don't get it. Maybe they don't want to get it just yet. But be patient and be kind. You never thought about any of this stuff before, did you? Isn't it so basic? But I'll tell you, this is the deep end. There's nothing more profound than this. And I'm amazed how much we miss it. I'm amazed that there has been wars throughout the world over the symbol, symbol of baptism, symbol of this and that, it's incredible. And, and thank God we've gotten away from a lot of that, but we're still, it's still human nature in so many ways. Ah. God gave us a person, getting to know him, getting to know Jesus, getting to know one another. Man, that's a lifetime. 
It's wonderful. You know, as, I, as I've been sharing with you a little bit, we, you know, we're on a journey together because uh, I'm, I'm not your teacher, I'm your brother, but you know, I, I want to share with you the things that I believe the Spirit of God is teaching me as I go through the Bible, especially as I go through life. And, and uh, you know, this part of the journey is, is not one I would have picked. It wasn't on my four-year plan. But, but as I shared with you a few weeks ago, it involves cancer. I, I, I found that I have cancer. I, I, uh, I didn't find it. <laughs> but, um, but it's one of those things that's like, oh, yeah, I just soon stay in the dark. No, shine your light through me, doctor, whatever it takes. Let's, let's, let's do that. And, and this week, just to keep you posted, what's, what, this week, more lights will be shined into the darkness. More, more lights will, will go into the darkness of my body where I'm already going into the darkness. And that's where the Spirit keeps telling me, don't go there, don't go there. Every time I feel a twinge in my toe, it's cancer. Every time I start to feel an itch behind my ear, it's more cancer coming out there. That's, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. I go to all these charts and journals and all this stuff and all this stuff that no one can know because it involves tomorrow or 10 years from now. And, and I, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. But I invite the, the, the lights to look into my darkness this week and then so on Tuesday I'm going to have a, a bone scan and, and on Thursday I'm going to have a cat scan and I don't know why they want to scan my cat, uh, but... <laughs> I just want to know what, whatever, whatever, whatever it, it takes. Hopefully it hasn't spread. Hopefully it's something that you just, would you just cut it out? Yes, cut it out. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be cool? But you know what? Here's the deal. Cancer can't win. Doesn't matter how much it spreads. Like we talked about last week. If cancer wins, if it, if it's, survives and kills every other part of me, the cancer goes down with me. It goes down with my body. The cancer dies because it just killed its host. That's pretty nice. <laughs> Cancer's not nice. It's, it's worthy of being hated. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but there are some things that get in our flesh and blood that are so much like the powers and principalities, the spiritual things that can get inside of our head. Things like worry that are the real wasters of life. And, and but when it comes to the physical body, cancer can't possibly win because it, it could take down my body, but I still live. I'll, I'll live forever. And I have tremendous hope in that. And yeah, I want to I wanna stay around. I'm glad that my particular cancer is pretty, pretty curable, especially if it's controlled there. Yeah, that's all that's cool. But the fact is, I'm not going to live forever. I mean, I want to enjoy every day. I love my wife. I love my grandkids. I love you folks. I love my life, all that sort of stuff. But ultimately, this other stuff, can't, it can't win. And I don't have to be angry and wonder, and I don't have to think in terms of, uh, oh, God, why did you give me cancer? And I don't have to think in terms of, well, I know why God gave me cancer, because this good thing and this good thing. I'm surrounded by good things. But I, I'll say again, like I said last week, you may, you may think of things differently, but I just want you to hear from me, my God did not give me this cancer. My heavenly Father did not give me cancer. He's the Father of lights, in Him there's no darkness at all. Cancer is a bummer, like a lot of cruddy, evil things in this world, but I, I refuse to believe that. My Father didn't give me cancer. No matter how many good things my Father will bring out of this, my heavenly Father didn't give me cancer. And it wasn't my earthly Father either. It's in my DNA. My dad had cancer. My dad died from cancer. And my brothers has the same kind of cancer as I do. But it's not like, oh, now I know who to blame. It's in the DNA. My dad didn't want it. Who wants that sort of stuff? Didn't come from my earthly father, didn't come from my heavenly father, didn't come from anyone who loves me. But the fact that I've been loved, that's the light. That's the hope. That's the, that's the joy. Bad things don't come from the Father, but we go to the Father. We, we, we go to those who have loved us. We go to those that, that we have loved. That's the future for all of us. The future is bright. And, and whatever bumps, whatever troubles along the road, okay, okay, we'll deal with it. I'm not nearly as brave as I might sound, just to let you know. <laughs> I'm on my happy horse right now, so I'll tell my wife, how you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm riding my happy horse. <laughs> it's keeping that balance, you know. Listening to the Spirit. Don't go to the darkness. Don't go to the darkness. Don't go back to that book. You read enough. <laughs> leave that, leave that, leave that, leave that. Stay here. Love right now. Love right now. 
And if you love, you live. And if you live, you have a light. And if you have a light, shine it. And that's, that's every day, every day we live. Let's turn to the Father with a closing song.